Why is the Higgs boson? It's what gives everything mass. If we weren't made of massive particles, we'd fly around at the speed of light. Some people would like that, but you'd never join together to form bodies again. So it's very important that we've got masses. Uh, at first sight, everything should go at the speed of light, and you've got to stop things going at the speed of light. Otherwise, they're all whizzing apart, not interacting. So you have to put a term in which allows for a mass, which will slow it down a bit. But different particles have got different masses. You know, if you just think of the uh, standard particles in the universe, the electron, for example, and say the quarks, the top quark, there's a difference of about a factor of 350,000 between the mass of the electron and the mass of the, t of the top quark. And yet those are in the same family of particles that make up the standard model. And why? It's a, a particle. It's also what we call a field, which means it's sort of you know, it, it permeates all regions of space. It's one of those things which is very esoteric, off the end of the maths that most people can deal with, and off the end of the maths that most theoretical physics people can deal with. The particle is just the, the end product, if you like. The big thing you talk about that, that particle physicists are interested in is the field. The field is the, is the concept of this object that permeates the whole universe. If it's found it gives a basis for cosmology and masses of particles so that we become more secure in our ideas of what the universe is made of. And this is the difference between the field and the particle. The particles, if you like, are the fluctuations, the oscillations in that background field. So it's the equivalent of it with electromagnetism. We think of the electromagnetic field pervading the universe. Its fluctuations are the photons. The photons of light are the fluctuations in that field, and that's what the equivalent of the boson, the particles, are. They're the, they're the fluctuations in this field. And then, you, so you can imagine, you need quite a lot of energy to get the field to get excited enough to produce those bosons in the first place. And that's what the collision of the protons can do for you. What happens when two protons collide at tremendous energies that makes the Higgs boson show its face? Well, I guess, you know, you just... So the, the way the Higgs has appeared in this is it's, you know, you create, the, you get this collision, you create particles, which then can annihilate, and, and you get a series of events happening. Now, if you get enough of those, then rare stuff can happen, okay? And what's one of the rare things that happens that may have happened, we think, is that a Higgs particle decayed into two photons, and that's what we've detected, but in a way that, that only the Higgs would have done. So that's how we've detected it. Can I make a suggestion then? Why aren't we searching for the Higgs field? Why are we searching for the particles if they're so hard to find? Because the Higgs field is even harder. <laughs> That's the problem. That, uh, so we're, we're hoping that by, by finding the particles, we'll actually gain some information about the field. I cannot explain it simply to the general public because it is well, I would use the word recondite, and that means that it's so obscure that you have to go and look up the words and the meaning in a dictionary. Uh, and that is the difficulty. You have to use a mathematical language which is rather obscure in order to get to grips with it. And you have to have a mental picture. I mean, the one that's used, you'll find my colleagues love this, is a Mexican hat. Can I bring my hat in for this point, at this point? <laughs> well, this is where the Higgs lives. The, the Higgs lives on, on, on this hat. And you imagine there's a potential that runs down and then has a minimum around here. My finger is the, is the Higgs. So you start out, and it's in this point here. This, this hat is, the, is what we call the Higgs potential. It sort of controls what the Higgs is doing. So, you know, just think of the, of the Higgs as being like a little ball on this hat and it, it's rolling around, say. So at the top here, okay, it's unstable because, you know, the excitations are unstable because if you nudge it a little bit, it's going to fall down the hat, okay? Now, that happens, it rolls down, you get a process of what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking, then the Higgs ends up down here, okay, and then the excitations around that point here, this point at the bottom of the hill, if you like, at the bottom of the hat, those are what we call the Higgs particle. And it's some, the properties of the excitations around this point also give mass to everything else. That doesn't mean anything to you, but to people in the field, they would know roughly if, whether I've got it right for a start, and I'm not sure I've got it right, and whether this is the right physics. And it is the oscillation in a, in a symmetric well, which has a certain symmetry, which causes 
the Higgs boson. So the Higgs particle is a, is a very unstable particle and that's part of the issue, right? If, if it was really stable they'd be all out there and you'd just be able to find them. So let me give you an idea of how difficult it is to, to generate them. There are uh, uh, on average 200 million collisions of a second between the protons and the uh, going one way and, and the other way. So two protons smashed together and that's happening 200 million times a second. Right? This, the, the accelerator has been running for about best part of a year, 200 million collisions a second. Do you know how many Higgs have been detected? How many potentially have been detected in this, this data? Uh, in some of the channels, three. Three Higgs. So these are small statistics, right? Because they're very difficult to produce these particles and then, and then be guaranteed that you be fairly confident that you've seen it because they're, they're, you need a lot of energy to produce them and then they decay very rapidly and you have to be fairly confident that you understand the decay products in order to reconstruct what you think is the, is the, is the Higgs in the first place. So there's, there are many protons colliding and very relatively few Higgs being produced. There's lots of other stuff being produced which is far easier. There was a Conservative MP William Waldegrave who asked for people to write one page of A4 to explain the Higgs boson to the public and there was a competition and somebody won it. And you can't really do that. That's what you're asking me to do. One page of A4, written simply, and talk about Mrs. Thatcher moving through a party and everybody coming towards her and making a mass around. Well, I can give you an analogy for how the, how the uh, Higgs mechanism works. Um, so so the, the, the mechanism, the, the analogy people normally use is, is they say, well, imagine a room, right, I don't know, in Hollywood or something, right, and, and the room's empty. And you get some superstar, like, I don't know, Brad Pitt walks into that room and there's no one in the room so he can walk about freely, there's no problem. Okay, now you go later on in the day and the room is filled with people. Okay, That's, let's call them Higgs people if you like, right? Now, Brad Pitt walks into that room and he can't so easily move about because everywhere he goes he gets surrounded by these, these Higgs people who sort of want to talk to him, want to be with him, you know, want to associate themselves with him. And so, if you like, it's difficult for him to move about. It's like he's got sort of you know, a lot of mass, if you like. That's the analogy of the Higgs mechanism, really. It's like, you know, you fill, permeate space with, with this particle, so rather than being here, it's down here, and then that gives mass. That every, or everything else sort of, sort of absorbs the mass from that. That's not it at all. You have to talk about broken gauge symmetry and different groups and all sorts of things which are too abstract for even undergraduates, we don't teach them that. It is a difficult subject for undergraduates. You need a schooling in this subject before it makes any sense. What happened last week? What happened last week? Well, I don't want to say that they discovered the Higgs boson because they didn't discover it, they, they, but there was a, a smoking gun, shall we say. So last week was the sort of the preliminary set of data. That's, that's really important, right? Because there's a risk that everyone will say, this is it now, it's all done. This is a preliminary set of data, which is kind of the culmination of the initial runs that were done throughout this year, up until I think about October. Runs of the LHC, protons going around the LHC and looking at the collisions. And two groups announced results, two of the experiments, the ATLAS experiment and the CMS experiment. And both were specifically looking for signatures of the Higgs particle. And uh, they've both seen what look like excess events. That means events above what the background would be and above what you would um, naturally think you should get from the standard model. And these events are at a over a certain mass range, as I said, about 125 times the mass of the proton. And what they're hoping is that as more and more data is taken, the significance of these events, well, it will either grow so they'll see more and more of these events building, building, building above the background like a volcano rising up. Or if these events are not really due to a Higgs, what they'll see over the course of the next few months is these events basically disappearing back into the background noise again. I guess what would have been more interesting is if they hadn't found it, <laughs> right? Because then we'd be thinking, oh, right, okay, where did all this mass come from? So, of course, it's the Higgs particle. That's after Peter Higgs, the uh, particle physicist in Edinburgh. I got Higgs here, if I can find it. This is 1964, Peter Higgs, Broken Symmetries. That's the paper where he comes up with 
a version which is written in the language of particle theorists, which is Lagrangians and covariant derivatives and all sorts of frightening mathematics. I and mean, it's frightening for me because I'm not used to this language. This work was done back in the 1960s, okay? It, it, it actually, I was thinking about this earlier today, that it just shows you, you know, that you work on the topical things, you work on the exciting things. In the 1960s, people were working on the standard model. And of course, they realized there was this problem with the masses of the gauge particles. And they knew they had to come up with a mechanism to give the gauge particles masses. The standard model had them all massless. So not surprisingly, it wasn't just Peter Higgs working on this. There was a, a group, uh, Braut and Anglais were working on it in Belgium. And then there was a, a group of three people working on it in, in, uh, at Imperial College, including a good friend of mine, Tom Kibble. And the paper, they were working independently of each other on different aspects of it. And in fact, the papers all appeared within a few months of each other. In fact, almost a few weeks of each other. It will always be known as the Higgs mechanism in the community. And it will be outrageous if he's not rewarded. But if the Higgs boson hasn't been discovered, no prizes will be awarded. So it's contingent. It depends on whether they actually see it. If they do see it, it's going to be somebody in that group. Who do you give the credit to? I remember at one stage when it used to be called the Higgs-Kibble mechanism, and then it became the Higgs mechanism. And who knows where it, I mean, it, it looks, of course, it looks like it's got to go to Higgs if, if a prize is given. Um, but there's this crazy rule, I think, in the uh, Nobel panel, which is it's meant to go to no more than three people. Well, Brout sadly died earlier this year. Um, historically, the order in terms of publications is Brout and Anglais, then Higgs, and then Kibble and his collaborators. And so um, you've potentially got H Higgs and Anglais, and then you've got the three collaborators. So it's a difficult call. I'm not going to call it. <laughs> but one of the three of them should get it. <laughs> I think they should abandon this three people maximum and give it to the, all five of them. Yeah, it was, it was such an exciting time, Brady. I mean, you know. You, you must be picking up on it, right? In particle physics, it's just great time, right, with the neutrinos, and then you've got the spherical electrons, and you've got the LHC just producing this amazing data. Yeah, we were all excited, and then we, uh, it was all a bit of a damp squib for us because we went over to watch it all on a big screen. We did watch it on the internet, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't great because uh, the internet connection was rubbish, not, not at Nottingham, but at said. So we had it all hooked up onto a, a big screen, you know, like, and uh, the stream was just rubbish. And it's kind of ironic because the guys at CERN invented the internet and yet the internet connection wasn't working very well. 